Welcome back, fellow counselors, to another fun-filled, sex-soaked, and blood-drenched summer here at Camp What Happened, the show-slash-holiday destination that shares fireside stories of the video game, movie, and etc. industries. And since we're all still haunting and booing through this monstrous month, there won't be a better time to discuss the video game career of one of the most iconic slasher villains in cinematic history. Jason Voorhees has been going through it for the last 40-some years, a life dotted with dizzying highs, terrifying lows, and creamy intestine-stuffed middles. One of those terrifying lows, of course, was the Friday the 13th video game. Ah, uh, no, try again. Yeah, that's the one. Now, while the NES version made by Atlas certainly seems initially worthy of a what happened, it was simply just one hockey-masked face in a throng of LJN licensed Drek. It was rushed, had confusing instructions, and not one member of the Japanese team that worked on it wants to spill the tea. Regardless, the far more interesting story is the one we'll be telling today, that of 2017's Friday the 13th The Game, the asymmetrical multiplayer experience that doubled as a love letter to the franchise, which was developed by Gun Media and Ilphonic. It went from a wholly original project to gaining a major license, and from being pitched to publishers to being turned down by every single one, to being shut down due to reasons outside their control, well, there's a lot to unpack from this gore-filled sleeping bag. And with the moon already high in the sky over Crystal Lake, well, let's find out what happened to Friday the 13th, the game. <laughs> It started life as its own unique title, or rather, one that was meant to pay homage to slasher films of the past. Gun Media CEO Wes Keltner and his partner Ronnie Hobbs wanted to make a multiplayer horror experience where a team of teens would battle for survival against a crazed maniac. This iteration was called Summer Camp, with the idea being that if it does well, they could make additional episodes or games built off the same framework, but focusing on other movie settings like suburbia. For a time, it was going to be called the Slash series, or Slasher Part 1, Part 2, etc. And they had already drafted a detailed design document about how everything would work. Now, around this time, there was one particular game that pushed the asymmetrical multiplayer dynamic as its focal point, and that was Turtle Rocks Evolve, who, funnily enough, was the first development studio Gun Media turned to on how to build a game like this. See, Gun specializes in concepting and design, and needed to shack up with a partner with more technical and programming experience to breathe life into game ideas. Turtle Rock suggested Ilphonic, who had worked on both Evolve and Crisis 3 as a support studio and would make an ideal partner for the project. One quick meeting later, Ilphonic were on board, and that's when the eponymous summer camp started being built. Gun Media had raised over a million dollars from investors to make a playable prototype, and soon enough, they were sending info and screenshots to IGN and other media outlets to hopefully gain some groundswell. Getting eyes on your game isn't easy, and for your typical indie game, 60% of the time, it doesn't work. Every time. That doesn't make sense. But call it fate, luck, or whatever you want, the Friday the 13th IP was both simultaneously blessed and cursed, with the former being explained by Wes Keltner himself. Two weeks later, after the IGN article, I received an email from Horror Inc. requesting a meeting. I thought it was someone trolling me, so I ignored it. A month later, they emailed again, this time with Sean Cunningham CC'd. I knew it was legit and arranged the meeting. They offered me the license for Friday the 13th, and that phone call changed my life forever. It took a lot of back and forth to come to terms, as Horror Inc. had very little, i.e. zero, experience with how modern video games were made and sold. They are a movie company after all. But once the ink was dry, Summer Camp started to go under renovations to become the first Friday the 13th game in almost 30 years. This afforded the team access to every single movie as a reference point, to use the franchise's music, the characters' lore, a treasure trove of bloody goodies was opened up to them. 
It was a dream come true for the team. Their homage game was no longer, but they were now working on the beloved franchise that they were trying to pay tribute to anyway. See, Summer Camp already happened to have makeup master Tom Savini and legendary Jason actor Kane Hodder on board, so the stars were aligning quite well. The only problem though? Not one single publisher wanted anything to do with it. To explain why all the big mega cores were all like, uh, yeah, no thank you, to one of the biggest horror franchises of all time, well, that's something that Wes Keltner again can expand upon. Once we secured the license, I thought it would be a slam dunk for publishers. I was so very wrong, none of them wanted to touch it. You name them, I met with them. I spent months going from publisher to publisher and being told no each time. Each had their own reasons, but the main points they made were, We don't think players want a horror multiplayer game. Games based on film IP never sell well. And, we don't know how to predict sales for a product like this. So, since we were turned down by pretty much everyone, we had to make some decisions quickly. We knew that players would have higher expectations for a Friday game compared to Summer Camp. We were still the same indie team, but in the eyes of players, that didn't matter. They see a name as large as Friday the 13th, they expect a much bigger game. Kickstarter made the most sense to us. Thankfully, that Kickstarter was in fact an overwhelming success, raising $823,000 against their 700 k goal. A particular reality of game development, however, which we've talked about before, is that in most cases, the amount of money raised via crowdfunding for any project of a certain scope and on multiple formats is a drop in the bucket compared to titles funded through traditional means. The flip side to that, however, is without your EAs or Ubisofts, the team worked Working on Friday were free to make the game as they saw fit, not having to abide by a committee of execs or having marketing tell them that they needed to adhere to a certain rating. But the fact remained that while the team was passionate, they were still incredibly small and didn't have the level of support that bigger teams tend to get. There's always going to be skull-splitting technical headaches. This of course led to long hours for the team to sort through all the programming challenges left in Unreal's wake. But the game was finally taking shape, especially when it came to the more fun aspects, like working with Hodder and Savini. Tom was brought in specifically to plan out many, many, many of Jason's kill animations, as well as a hellish new take on the killer. While Hodder, the man behind the mask himself, would bring said animations to brutal life through motion capture. When Kane was on set, stabbing, chopping, and crushing, the team were in awe, seeing the actor who portrayed Jason a record four times just thriving in his element. Yeah, you go, King! Ah, oh, that's just a work of art. Ilphonic and Gunn started filling the game out with more maps, counselors, Jason models, and planning out future content. While billed as a multiplayer-centric game, single-player modes were being worked on, lore narrated by central figures in the franchise were being recorded, and bikini bottoms were being lovingly handcrafted. Jason had his throwing knives aimed for the PC, the PS4, and Xbox One and was set to unleash on all three on May 26, 2017. A tall order for any indie studio. I have to preface this for everyone out there, especially if you are not a horror fan, but by the time Friday was set to come out, pretty much every fan worth their salt was aware of it, as the fanbase were starving for new content, as there hadn't been a new movie in over 8 years. Plenty of them were pitched and written by a number of people, but sadly, none of them ever filmed. So there was a certain level of anticipation for the game from those that supported the Kickstarter, but also from the general mainstream audience. There were roughly 12,000 backers by the time the campaign had finished, which is at least a number to shoot for, but there was no way the team could have predicted just how popular Friday would go on to be. Leading into the launch, they took a look at the information culled from a late beta, which had around 5,000 people playing, and further factored in the pre-orders outside of the Kickstarter Starter, which therefore led them to upping their servers to account for around 30,000 concurrent players, which thankfully solved the problem. That is something I would be saying to you if on launch day alone they hadn't been slammed by 75,000 rabid counselors all wanting to frolic in the waters of Crystal Lake. 
While all three versions saw issues with connectivity, crashes, long wait times, and XP not properly being awarded, just like many other and often much bigger game launches, it was the Xbox version that suffered the most among the three. I'm going to turn again to Wes Keltner to explain the how and the why. You couldn't play the game for the first week of launch on Xbox. We couldn't figure out why. It worked in our test environment. We could connect easily and play with each other on the dev branch. What was the difference between our dev branch and the live branch? We didn't sleep that week. It wasn't until we got on the phone with a senior engineer at Microsoft that we found out the problem. When we applied to have our game on Xbox, we were required to go through Microsoft's indie program. No big deal, everyone does that unless you're one of the big companies. However, we were given matchmake code from Microsoft that has a maximum concurrent player load of around 5k. Plenty for most indie multiplayer games. Everything melted. Once the MS engineer spotted the problem, they gave us the same code they grant bigger games like Call of Duty, Battlefield, etc. And voila, Xbox players were up and running. It was a tough, tough week. To make up for the rocky launch, the team offered a bunch of free content for fans, including 13,000 XP points used to unlock accessories and perks, free costumes for several counselors, and the classic aqua blued skin purple drip NES Jason complete with his own 8-bit music. Fortunately, after a week or two, things started to smooth out, and matches were being played on every format. And while various bugs, exploits, and balance issues still needed to be patched out, what players found was an exciting and varied game of multiplayer. With several ways for counselors to win, including calling for the cops, taking cars or boats to safety, simply surviving Jason's Night of Terror, or working together to actually kill him, there was a lot of fun to be had. As time went on, lots more skins, Jason kills, maps, additional counselors, as well as modes were introduced, including those single player ones I hinted at earlier. The best of the bunch being the Hitman-esque campaign where Jason needs to navigate around a map to specific locations at specific times to kill teens while they're getting high, getting drunk, or getting some. Reviews, however, at launch were pretty mixed, owing a lot to the rough technical start that the game had, with many publications not even able to connect to a lot of games, which certainly put a damper on Friday the 13th critically. Commercially, however, Camp Crystal Lake had a booming summer. In three months, Jason had slashed up 1.5 million copies across all versions, a phenomenal success for an indie game, and even a big hit in terms of commercial AAA IPs. This also doubles as good evidence that marketing execs oftentimes have no fucking clue what they're talking about. The content continued throughout the year, with the game adding more and more value, culminating in the Virtual Cabin, a first-person thrill ride that saw you solving puzzles, dodging Jason, and admiring props and easter eggs from all over the franchise. Completing this mode then awarded players with a tease of upcoming content, a new Jason in the form of the Uber variant, as well as a Grendel spaceship map from Jason X, which of course would have contained a spot to perform the famous Sub-Zero face smash. While the game retained very healthy numbers throughout its first year, its bright future was tragically cut short. Not long after the virtual cabin was added, Ilphonic and Gun Media were informed that due to a lawsuit which was kicking off between Horror Inc.'s Sean Cunningham and the writer of the original Friday the 13th, Victor Miller, no new content could be made for the game. The lawsuit was to establish who owned what, with Miller's claim centering around the fact that he owned all characters established in his original script, including Pamela Voorhees and young Jason. However, since he had no hand in writing any of the subsequent movies, including older hockey mask Jason, it led to complications. Who would ultimately own the rights for Jason, and, and which version of him? Horror Inc? Miller? It's still a bit confusing, and even more so when you factor in international movie rights into the equation, so the whole thing is just a sloppy mess, and it's the fans that are losing. Fortunately though, in 2021, the matter has successfully been not resolved yet and is still going on today with no clear resolution in sight. 
Ilphonic and Gun Media had hoped that the lawsuit would have cleared up in a few short months, but when it was evident that wasn't going to happen, via multiple appeals, delays, and other rulings, they had to move on to other projects so they could continue to work and make a living. Servers remained online until November 2020, an additional two years, and while the game remains playable today through peer-to-peer, -peer, it's obviously a less reliable experience, but because the fanbase is so passionate and there's still no new movies to watch, plenty of counselors are still online, barricading doors and rummaging for those elusive pocket knives. The mood among the team, however, was bittersweet, emphasis on the bitter, as they got to work on something they truly loved, but had it taken away so suddenly. It's like going through a bad breakup with someone and then being asked about it over and over again. However, we got to build a game based on one of our favorite horror franchises of all time. We adore that series. We gushed over it and poured everything we had into it. We studied every single film, practically every scene frame by frame. This wasn't a money thing. This was a passion thing for us. We loved it and it was taken from us. That day still haunts me. We had so many ideas, so much content we were working on that we were forced to stop making. Some folks think we quit because we wanted to. No. We were forced to stop and it really hurt us as a team. It hurt me personally. I fell into a depression, my heart just got broken, and fans are yelling at us like we were doing this. Like this whole thing was our fault. It was hard. Fans were confused and we were not allowed to say much. F13 was one of the greatest things to ever happen to me and also one of the most painful. Ilphonic went on to another asymmetrical multiplayer game in the form of Predator Hunting Grounds, as well as the recent Arcade Geddon, while Gun Media would publish Blooper Team's Layers of Fear 2 and are currently working on other unannounced horror projects. This was a rough one, specifically for me, a huge fan of the Friday the 13th series. While the game certainly had a rough few weeks, over the subsequent months, it was a rallying point for a lot of the Friday fanbase to meet, chill, and just have fun. It's also clear that all parties involved on the development side were just as passionate. They sweat and bled Friday the 13th for several years, and just as things were heating up, they had to be cooled down. Down into the murky depths of Crystal Lake itself, where the franchise unfortunately now lies. Thanks again to Mr. Keltner for graciously answering my questions. If you know of any other franchise, movie, video game, or otherwise you'd like me to stalk, shout them out in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or make a frantic cry for help at the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate what you'd like to see in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Q